Yeah. Yeah, so it's cool you came out, Sam. Thanks. <laughs> that was a last minute ad, like literally within the last minute or so. But so cool. Um, yeah, I wanted to introduce Chris. Um, he's a pioneer in developing instrumentation to look at or um, you know observe. I guess is the right word. Terahertz um, frequency uh, waves, uh, frequency uh, bandwidth, and he's going to explain how that's why it's important, what we can learn from it, and the challenges of doing it. Um, He's been all over. He's worked at TRW. He's worked at JPL, Aerospace Corp, I believe, or just yeah. not Aerospace. Okay, it's TRW. TRW. Um, lots of years ago for that one. Uh, but uh, he's out here this week. Uh, you can't imagine all the places he's bouncing around to to go check up on projects that he's either the principal lead for or he's part of the team that's building it. Balloons, small sats, cube sats, um, telescopes. Uh, runs the gamut, and uh, it's great to have you, Chris. Thank you so much for being in person. That's really special. Oh, thank you. So, Chris Walker. I'm going to do a little hot swap here. Positioning. Yeah, your pocket, and there. If you could stand behind this. Oh, okay. Paul, if you can have Chris stand just to the left of where Chris is right now, that will be perfect for the 37 people that are remote. Right here? Yeah, right there. Okay. Well, I'm a teacher, so I'm going to go point my finger around slides. I can't help it uh, as we go by. But yeah, I'm Chris Walker. I'm a professor of astronomy at the University of Arizona in Tucson, Arizona. And I did meet Paul in a very nice uh, meeting uh, out in northern, uh, just north of the Catalina Mountains a few months ago. And I gave a talk like this there, and he was very kind to invite me. And we found a time where you're going to meet, and I'm happy, happen to be here in town, so I'm very happy to be here uh, tonight. And so what we're going to talk about is a little bit different than what you guys normally do. I'm on the uh, far infrared part of the spectrum where, I, where we operate. And what we do there is try to answer a fundamental question that everyone's asking. We live in a galaxy comprised of stars, planets, and people. Where did it all come from? And this is a nice picture you guys will appreciate. This is from the summit of Mount Graham uh, in eastern Arizona, about 10,500 feet. This was taken during the site testing on Mount Graham back in the 80s uh, before they put the telescopes up there, the LBT, the Vatican, and there's a submillimeter wave telescope as well. So here's the night sky, clear night. There's the Milky Way. And can you guys guess what those two glowy things are on the side? Phoenix and Tucson. <laughs> that's right. Phoenix and Tucson, that's right. Um, and so uh, when I talk to my uh, freshman astronomy classes, what I'll say is that, you know, this is a clear night. And there's the, the Milky Way. The Milky Way is like a Frisbee seen at John. It's like a Frisbee with a tennis ball in it. And here we're looking at our Frisbee uh, edge on. We live about halfway out on that Frisbee. And we're looking back in. And all that black stuff in the middle there that's kind of blocking the, the pretty uh, star clouds and stuff is dust uh, in the interstellar medium. And for every little gram of dust, there's 100 times more gas. You say, well, that stuff's just getting in the way. But actually, that's really important because where do we all come from? Uh, next slide, please. We came from that, the interstellar medium. 4.7 billion years ago, this is where your body was. Every atom and molecule in your body was part of the interstellar medium. And through the process of star formation, the sun formed, and an accretion disk formed around the sun, and the planets are debris left over from that accretion process. So we are very physically connected to the interstellar medium. So there's lots of questions still about where the interstellar medium came from, where it's going, how it's different from one type of a galaxy to the other through cosmic time. Uh, next slide, please. And most of those questions can be embodied in this. This is the life cycle of the interstellar medium. Um, so we have like the Milky Way in the middle, just sort of a ground ourselves. But in the Milky Way, there are giant molecular clouds. When I say molecular clouds, I also mean dust clouds. And it's within these regimes that stars, planets, and people ultimately form. And these giant molecular clouds are the largest massive bodies in the galaxy sometimes composing 100,000 solar mass material. The one that we're all very familiar with, of course, is the Orion Nebula. And next to the Orion Nebula 
is the Orion molecular cloud. And star formation starts at one end of a cloud and consumes the cloud like a disease, uh, forcing shock waves through the cloud, forming stars. Um, and, the, and so this is kind of the life cycle that describes all that. So we can start anywhere. But if you start at the top, there's warm, neutral, and ionized gas. When I say it's probably like atomic hydrogen gas mostly. Over time, gravity will pull that together, and you'll have neutral atomic hydrogen clouds. That's sort of the bluey thing on the uh, moving down. I have to go to the board. I'm sorry. Uh, or right here, a formation of atomic hydrogen clouds. When enough of this stuff gets in one place, and gravity can pull it together and form uh, neutral hydrogen clouds. And then from there, you can get dust clouds, and then more and more stuff gets to one place. You get stars form. You get to meet the genes mass criteria. It's called. Then stars will form. Stars are like angry teenagers and destroy their environment in which they were formed, and the whole cycle starts over again. So that's the life cycle of the ISM. And we want to probe different phases of the ISM. Many, many NASA missions and many... Uh, other astronomy projects have focused on the sort of the right hand uh, side of that. Uh, that's the star formation up to the destruction of the clouds. Very few uh, missions or projects have focused on the formation of clouds on the left side. So one way you can probe all these different phases is to look at emissions and absorption lines from the gas associated with these different phases. And what you see on the outer ring there are the transitions of carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon monoxide, and other things that we can use to probe these different transitions. And so what we've been doing over the last 20 or 30 years is building very high frequency radios that can pick those up. Uh, next slide, please. Because it turns out that those transitions that we need to probe these different phases, uh, many of them are not in the UV, they're not in the optical, not even the infrared, they're in the far infrared. In the far infrared, when you think about frequencies, you, you get into the terahertz range. And a terahertz, that bottom left there, is equal to one million megahertz. And a megahertz is like what we're used to thinking about, like FM radios, 88 to 108 megahertz. Well, this is a, a million megahertz is one terahertz. So these, I have the frequencies of these lines, one of them is actually two lines at 1.4 terahertz, the carbon lines at 1.9 terahertz, and the O1 lines at 4.7 terahertz. And there's other uh, lines. We, what we do is we build instruments to probe these high-frequency radio receivers to probe these different emission absorption features toward these objects to get the life cycle of the ISM. And this gets us going to some very interesting places. Uh, next slide. Because the problem is, is that those high frequencies is the beautiful water vapor that's responsible for our entire existence. Uh, that absorbs our photons. So just like you can be clouded out when you go to a star party, so we can be clouded out as well because the water vapor sucks up all those high frequency photons before they hit the ground. And what this plot is, is a plot of atmospheric transmission, y-axis versus frequency. And this is for assuming there's one millimeter precipital water vapor in the sky. And what that is, if you take a square centimeter, you know, about the size of a sugar cube in projection and, and and, and, and uh, stretch it all the way out to the top of the atmosphere and collapse all the water. It needs to be one millimeter or less of condensed water vapor. And when that happens, then you get this kind of a transmission spectrum uh, on here. So if you if I have to walk over here again. So 100% transmission would be out in outer space, but we're here on the ground here for a lot of these observations. And so these, these, uh, these indicate the atmospheric transmission windows that we can operate in. And you can see we get a little bit of transmission, maybe as much as, you know, clo closing on 50% transmission on a very, very dry day in the winter in Arizona for the lower frequencies, but not for the higher frequencies. So we can do carbon monoxide uh, molecules. We can do some atomic carbon. But the rest of the high frequency spectrum we can't get because it's just too wet. And here's a picture there of the Heinrich Kurtz telescope, otherwise known as the submillimeter wave telescope that the University of Arizona operates. And that's on Mount Graham, Arizona, about 10,500 feet. And so we have that observatory. We build instruments for it to probe these different uh, spectral features. And again, if I didn't say it's 10 meter diameter mirror. Is what you have there. And the radio telescope is like any telescope. 
that you guys might use is the parabolic primary, hyperbolic secondary, and then the light goes through a hole in the back, a Cassegrain uh, type uh, telescope, where we have our receivers. Okay, uh, next slide. So I'm going to look around if you have questions as I go along, because I, I don't mind stopping and answering questions if you have them either in the audience or online. So just stop me. I'll keep talking. So you got to stop me. All right. So like I said, we build instruments for these telescopes. And one of the ones we built was the world's largest little radio receiver at very high frequencies. It's called SuperCam. It had uh, that's the name of it there. And it has it's uh, 64 pixels on the sky. Each one of those pixels is an independent receiver at 345 gigahertz or 345,000 megahertz to look at CO lines. And the, the little the detectors we use are superconducting detectors. So they have to operate around four Kelvin, between four and five Kelvin. So they sit in this cryostat here. And here's a couple of my former students. They've gone on to bigger and better things uh, already. Um, there's Tiara Cottom there and Jenna Klusterman there. And they're working on this instrument from both sides. And this is down in my lab at University of Arizona. Uh, next slide. And so what you're seeing here, besides Jenna's thumb, is you see there's an eight by eight array of little holes there. Those are feed horns, if you, if you guys are, are radio folks. So each one of those basically takes a bit of the light from that telescope on Mount Graham and sucks it down through that like a funnel. It hits a superconducting detector and it gets down converted to lower frequencies where it can be amplified and uh, processed by a computer. To produce one pixel? Produce one pixel, that's right. So when you make a map, you have 64 pixels, and what we do is drift scans and, and download the spectrometer as we go, and we can build some beautiful images, I'll show you in a second. Yeah, thanks for asking the question. Feel free to pipe up. Oh, um, well, because of folks online, well, if you could repeat the question, uh, because they can't hear the Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so what was your question? Uh, the, each of one of those pits produces one pixel. Right, so the question is, each one of these uh, uh, features in this spectrum, I mean, in this array, produces one pixel. So it's eight by eight array. Each one produces one pixel. So you get a total of a whopping 64 pixels. However, each of those pixels is broken down into a thousand frequency points. So you get a thousand frequency points that it, for every spatial pixel. So in terms of information, it's 64,000 pixels. As far as image resolution, do you pan it then? Is that what you're talking about, the scanning or whatever? Yeah. Yeah. So the spatial resolution is set by the diameter of the telescope. It's just, you know, lambda over D, just like it is for any wavelength range. And so at these wavelengths, around one millimeter and with a 10 meter size telescope, our spatial resolution on the sky is about 25 arc seconds. So we get all the light within that 25 arc seconds and then create a spectrum from that. So we can look at, you know, at 64 or 25 arc second spots all at the same time. Yeah. I'm sorry, are you saying that you then stack uh, images uh, to get greater resolution? The spatial resolution? Yeah. yeah, yeah. In fact, I'll show you a picture in just a second. Uh, next slide. Um, so uh, where this lives, and this is this Heinrich Kurtz telescope up on Mount Graham, uh, that whole instrument lives in this castle grain cabin right behind the primary. So light comes in, hits the primary, then it gets focused up to the secondary, goes back through a hole through the back of the telescope, and goes into this instrument cabin where we have this instrument mounted. Uh, next slide. Right, and so here's a picture. This is a first light map of a, a massive star formation region called DR21. And this shows you kind of the you know, eight by eight uh, spectrum of what we got. So every pixel produces a little spectrum. See these little blips here? Each one of those is a CO emission line, a carbon emission line. So we get these images at the same time. So if you want to fill the gaps between the pixels, you, you move the whole telescope over maybe 10 arc seconds to do another image, move the whole telescope over 10 arc seconds to another image, and then co-add them in the computer to get a more uh, higher resolution image over a large amount of space. And so what the hot, like the red indicates is a region where a high mass star is forming and it's heated, the, the heat, the UV photons from the star 
as heated the carbon dioxide gas and made these spectra that you see here. Uh, next slide. All right. But what if we want to go to higher frequencies? That means we need to go to a higher, drier site. So this is actually a transmission, an optical, sorry, atmospheric transmission plot taken uh, that would be corresponding to Atacama, which is the high Andes down in Chile. So the, the gold one on the bottom is from Mount Graham, Arizona, 10,400 feet. And then the red one is from the high Andes at 16,500 feet. So we actually went there with our instrument. Uh, next slide. Here's a picture. It's the kind of crummy I took with my cell phone when I was down there at 16,641 feet. And this in the high Andes, it's, well, I think the highest observatory in Chile. And this one is a 12 meter diameter radio telescope. You can see the primary, the secondary, the hole where the light goes in the back. And there's the Casa Grande cabin, kind of similar to what we had at the SMT, but from here. Uh, and next slide. And then you can see there's the cabin on the left, and there's the grad student Brandon in there manning it. And that's all the electronics and junk you need to make the 64 pixel heterodyne receiver work. And then we made maps of the sky with this. Uh, next slide. And you can get some pretty uh, nice images. So in the bottom is an image that was taken from the Mount Lemmon uh, Sky Center using a 60 inch optical telescope of the Horsehead Nebula. And you guys are probably taking pictures of this yourselves. So you have the Horsehead Nebula on the bottom. Um, and you see it's nice and dark because there's dust you know, in the Horsehead Nebula itself and also in the uh, uh, next door neighbor uh, dust cloud below it. And then you have the you know H alpha emission and all that. And that's really pretty. And then what you see at the top is a terahertz image made of it in carbon monoxide with a super cam instrument. And the thing that we get with the CO lines is we get the velocity information about the cloud too, because the line can, can show Doppler shifts. Just like uh, you know, if a radio station is coming at you or a train's coming at you, you hear it at a higher frequency, or hear it on the radio at a higher frequency if the radio station is coming towards you, if it's going away from you it gets uh, red shifted, blue shifted, red shifted. And so what you see on the top there is velocity encoded. So red means that the emission was going away, blue means it's coming towards you and everything in between. And you can see it's almost like a flip because where it's just dark and not much is going on except for foreground stars in the optical image, it's full up in CO and it's just turbulent, just going nuts. It's like you took a spoon in there and just stirred it all up. And what's messing with it is star formation is happening inside that cloud. And star formation is a very violent process with lots of inflows, outflows, all kinds of stuff. So it kind of, uh, you need both images to figure out what's really going on. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and this is the same data, but was processed, before it was a first light image, and this is after it was fully data processed. So what you're seeing here is a CO image of the Horsehead Nebula. You can see this, the Horsehead Nebula up there on the top left of the image, you can just make it out. But you can see it's just really uh, just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's happening in that region. Uh, next slide. Okay, but that still isn't good enough, that atmospheric transmission. So we need to go either higher or a place where it's colder because if water is frozen out, it doesn't absorb the photons because it's in a crystalline form. Um, so we want to go someplace high where there's less water, period, and also or very, very cold. So another place we did experiments was a south, or and still doing them, is at the South Pole base. Uh, there you can have that precipital water vapor over a square centimeter is only 200 microns deep when you collapse it all the way down from the top of the atmosphere all the way to the ground. So you can see how much better the atmospheric transmission is. Uh, next slide, please. You're practically at sea level. No, actually, when we're at the, well, on the coast you are, but uh, what you see here is a map of Antarctica. And at the South Pole base there, it's actually also kind of the exact same height as Mount Graham. It's 10,400 feet, but it's all ice. Because you're right, Antarctica is a continent. It's relatively a low continent. It does have mountains and stuff, but it's mostly a desert down there in terms of uh, how often it rains. But it, or there's precipitation, but whenever it does, it's snow, and the snow doesn't melt. 
So after 12 million years of accumulation, even in a desert, you have 10,400 feet of ice. And so that's the altitude of, of the South Pole base. There's also a place called Delme I'll talk about in a minute that's 14,500 feet that we've uh, been to. Uh, okay, and how do you get to Antarctica to do astronomy? Well, you get on like United or American or Delta Airlines and you fly to Christchurch, New Zealand. And then from Christchurch, New Zealand, you take military aircraft like a C-130 or, or C-17 if you're lucky uh, to actually go to what's called the ice or Antarctica. Uh, next slide. How long is that trip from New Zealand? Oh, how long does it take to fly? Well, if you're in a, uh, in a if you're in a C-130, it takes eight hours. If you're in a C-17, it takes about four. <laughs> yeah. So you pray for the C-17, but the C-130 is what you almost always end up taking. Um, yeah, it's how cold was it? in Antarctica. No, in the plane. Oh, well, I'll tell you. Okay, so. What happens is, so up here in the top left of this picture, when you, uh, when you land in Christchurch, you go stay at a hotel or something, and then they go to this place called the uh, CDC, which is called the Clothing Distribution Center, and it's run by the National Science Foundation. And when you go there, they issue you all your cold weather gear, your parkas and your ski pants and your balaclava and your gloves and your goggles and all that stuff. And then uh, on the morning of your flight, which is usually within a day or two when you get to New Zealand, they make you wear all that stuff. Uh, and this is in uh, like October in New Zealand is like springtime here. And then you, ha you get on the airplane wearing all your survival gear. Um, uh, but it starts getting warm on the plane. And after a while, people just sort of strip down uh, when you're on the airplane. This is what it looks like in the C-130 if you've ever wandered um what it looks like how many people have been on c-130s Not fun. yeah you guys all have <laughs> yeah my and they give you these uh pre-flight briefings uh when you're down there in that uh, in that cdc and i've been down there and my wife says it's 14 times uh, I, I i don't know whether it's uh, maybe at least 12. um and when you get on, before you get on the plane they give you a pre-flight briefing the pilots do my favorite one was Pilot says, you know, if there's gonna, if there's some trouble during the flight, there'll be an, a horn that will sound, a light will blink on and off. He says, my recommendation to you is just to hold on to something heavy. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. We got on the plane, and they do issue you dog tags. And the other fun thing was, if I got to go do my medical exam, I'm going back in October for the, for the, this mission we're doing, and. Uh, they, they make you do the medical, you know, make sure you're not going to die on them down there and not have anything seriously wrong because there's not much of a hospital down there either. How long are these sorties? What's that? How long are these sorties? Uh, depends. The minimum is a month uh, or three or four months. So I've been down there three months at a time. And so they also make you do a dental exam and they make, they scan your x-ray and your teeth. And I always thought, you know, that was really nice to make us do a dental. And you know why they have you do the dental? My, my, my dentist, who was once a dentist for the CIA, believe it or not, says, Chris, that's not why they're doing it. <laughs> so, so do you know, what, you know why they do it? They identify your body that's right, on, when it gets all burned up on the ice. So anyhow, they don't tell you that. But you get on board the C-130, and it's, it gets pretty crispy up there, and people just kind of strip down. And after a while, people just wander around and try to sleep wherever possible on the C-130. Uh, no. It's loud, too. Yeah, you have to wear a little yeah, earplugs. Uh, next slide. And there is a C-130 landing on the ice down in McMurdo. And you can see it has skis on it. Uh, and it's run by the, uh, the Newark Guard. It's one who flies them down there, the Air Guard. Uh, next slide. And then when you arrive in Antarctica, you go on uh, the Ivan the Terror bus, which is <laughs> some big old thing made by Canadians. <laughs> yeah. And you get on that and they pack you in and then you go to McMurdo's, uh, go to the McMurdo station is what's on the right. It looks to me, it always looks like a dirty 19th century mining town. And it's kind of like a, it has a dormitories and stuff kind of run down 
college campus is kind of what the story is. And then you go to something called the NSF Chalet, where you begin many endless briefings uh, upon arrival for your safety and how to handle your trash down there and all that kind of stuff. Uh, next slide. And then not very far from right there, within you know a quarter of a mile, is Scott's Hut. And that is the Scott, the English guy who everyone died because uh, he didn't make it back in time. Anyway, you can go to Scott's Hut and it's pretty much been frozen in place uh, since the early 1900s. And on some Sundays, they'll open it up. You can go inside. There's actually a dead seal on the porch from when they half ate it in the early 1900s. There's cans open on the kid tables and stuff hanging up. It's just kind of like a freeze no frame. No maid service, no. Uh, next slide. Right, and here's some of the accommodations down there. There's one called Hotel California. That's for people who are going in and going out. This is McMurdo. If you're going into the deep field like the South Pole Bays or the uh, or uh, other places on the on the um, trying the dry valleys is another place people go. You hang out there for a day or two until you can get your airplane and fly on to the next position, next location. Is that a train? What's that? Is that on a train track or something? Uh, no, it's just on kind of stilts, so they can uh, pull the you know, blow the ice out from underneath it because it there's snow drifts. And then inside of there, there's a bunk room. It's very very nice area. And if you're there for a while, they, there's dormitories. It's like a college dorm room, and there'll either be two, three, four, five, or six people in a room at a time. Uh, next slide. Okay. So say your your business is in McMurdo, you want to go into the South Pole base and you get back on another C-130 and fly for about four hours from the coast to the South Pole base. I took this picture uh, looking out the window. Uh, this enter, enter, enter mountain range there. Really beautiful. Doesn't look real. Uh, next slide. And then this is when I first started going down there like 94, 95. And you would land uh, on the ice and get out of the C-130. And then you would go down like a steep hill into the South Emerson Scott South Pole base. Um, and there's a geodesic dome there and there's some archways and stuff. And you go down through there. Uh, next slide. Yeah. Uh, and when you go in into the dome, this is what it looks like. Uh, the inside of the dome uh, is at ambient temperature. so. When I was down there in like November-ish in the summer, it was like minus 40, minus 45 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's what it is there. And then there are buildings and they have freezer doors on them to keep the cold air out and the warm air in. And uh, down there on the right is the galley. And I remember the first time I arrived, it was kind of blizzardy. And we go down there and it was just some random Tuesday. And we go, we arrived around lunchtime, we go into the galley, and everyone's hooting, hollering, having a good time. They're wearing like jester hats and all this stuff. It was really weird. And there was like full-size cutouts of Star Trek, the next generation people <laughs> on the roofs of the building. It was a lot of fun. Uh, next slide. And uh, the inside under that geodesic dome, that's where they had the rooms for the people who would winter over they only had room for like maybe 30, 40 people there. And during the summer, the base population can go up to 175 or 200 people. And so what they would do is put you in these Quonset huts left over literally from the Korean War, just like the C-130s you fly on. And we live in there uh, during the summer. And you go in, and there's basically head-to-toe, head-to-toe bunks uh, on the ground on either side, separated by kind of shower curtains. And it was heated, uh, So, but, but you go in there and you work and you kind of collapse in your clothes and go to sleep. If you put your water bottle on the floor, the water bottle, free bottle freezes, uh, and then it was is hot at the top, you know. Anyhow, we loved it, you know, summer camp. Uh, next slide. Okay. Okay. Did you have a floor though? It was plywood, yeah. Okay, then this is kind of what we did. So here's a picture. Uh, you see the South Pole Station back there? Um, and then there's a C-130 someone just came in on. And then if you look closely in front of the dome, you'll see a ring of flags sticking up. That's the South Pole. 
the there's a ceremonial South Pole, and then about 50 meters away, they'll make the actual South Pole. And what reason they move the actual South Pole every year because the ice moves about I don't know 10 meters a year or something like that. So the actual geo, uh, geophysical South Pole moves, but they have a ceremonial pole there. And then the actual astronomy stuff is located about a kilometer away from the station. And you just kind of walk out there on a little road and you have to wait for the C-130s to go by uh, uh, on the way. And this is a picture of where we did our radio astronomy stuff. This was again in the mid nineties uh, to about 2004 or five that we did this. So we had this kind of a trailer looking situation and the telescope's up on top and it has a 1.7 meter off axis parabolic reflector. So light comes in, hits that, hits a little secondary and gets shot down a roof, a hole in the roof of the ceiling where the receivers are below. And then what we were looking at uh, is this thing over here, the top of the left, that's called, uh, that's the cat's paw nebula in the south, otherwise known as 6334. And the reason I show that is uh, and when we first put this thing together down there, I put, I put the whole receiver th this thing together and I was, I, I was got, it, got it on the sky. Then I went to bed and I woke back up about 12 hours later and it had made this nice image. This is an image of CO4 to 3 uh, emission. That's a CO molecule, it's carbon oxygen and it spins around. It's that spinning that produces the photons and the 4 to 3 has to do, tells you about how fast it's spinning. Um, so we had that, so that's the image of what it looked like. And then the associated spectrum is shown on the right. It shows you in one spectrum, we could get three different emission lines. So that spectrum is intensity or temperature versus frequency. It's like tuning through. So you're on the left where it's kind of just jaggedy noise. If you were to listen to it, it sounds like uh, static, like frying bacon. And then when you tune along, you pick up a, a CO radio station, like tuning through a radio station on your car radio. It's really loud. 12 CO is the most abundant molecule of CO, isotope of CO, so it's really loud. Then we got atomic carbon, and then we got a 13 C car atomic carbon as well, all in the same uh, spectrum. Uh, yeah. How does your telescope compensate for wind? Oh, it's just the motors are just made really strong to compensate for the wind. Yeah. And actually, at the South Pole base itself, there isn't typically on a given day, it's pretty calm. It's really, because uh, you hear about winds in Antarctica all the time, the howling winds are mostly on the coast because air, come, you know, the plateaus at a very high altitude, 10,500 feet, and then the air rolls down, uh, gathering speed to the coast. Uh, so actually at the top of the mountain of ice, is pretty calm. Uh, next slide. Oh, what was Iron Man doing there? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Now this is the this is the real Tony Stark. So he was the uh, I'm the guy who built the receivers and stuff for this project. Tony was the principal investigator of it, and I so I'm actually going to be seeing him on Thursday. He works with me on another project I'm doing now. So he's an actual person, and a fun story. He went to Caltech as an undergrad, and he got accepted and all that. And he went there the first day. He had his letter, and he went to register. And then he said, I'm Tony Stark. And the guy looked at him and looked down, you're not on the list. He says, what do you mean on the list? He said, well, people thought it was a made up person. And so you were deleted. <laughs> it's a true story. And then they showed him the letter and they reinstated him because he really is Tony Stark. Yeah. Uh, Rob, how far are you, are you from the ocean? Oh, from the ocean? How far is it? Oh, about... Uh, Good question. Maybe 1,500 miles, yeah. 2,000 miles. We were 18 months ago, we were in Antarctica. Yeah. A peninsula. The peninsula with all the animals. Right. Yeah. At the South Pole base, there's not even, there's nothing. Uh, there's no birds. There's no seals. There's no penguins. There's not even insects because it's just too cold for them and no water because it's all frozen. So you went to the the, 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 the garden place <laughs> in Antarctica. That's where they have the marathons too. No, yeah, we have, we have them in McMurdo, we have runs there too. But yeah, so it, it, we're in the deep freeze uh, at the South Pole base. Okay, so remember the picture with the telescope on top and the light went through the roof? 
well, this is what it went to. This is the, what one of our instruments looked like. We built this uh, in one of my laboratories at the University of Arizona. The light comes from the telescope, bounces through some optics, a couple of mirrors, flat mirrors, and then goes into this thing called a cryostat, which is a giant thermos bottle. You know, thermos bottles keep things either cold or hot. And so uh, because it has a vacuum in it between an inner vessel and the outer wall. So in here, we have a, a vessel full of liquid helium, and we bolt our detectors on the bottom of it. And because our detectors are superconducting detectors, and that's what it looks like. It has a bunch of electronics to make it work. But that's what the instruments look like. They produce that nice spectra you saw a minute ago. Uh, that's what it looks like. Uh, next slide. All right. So if you were to get out of the South Pole base today, the dome is gone, sadly. Um, but the, uh, they built this newer base there now. And I was, I've stayed in there a few times over the, uh, over the intervening years. It's a really nice, fancy looking place. Lots of labs and things. Uh, next slide. That dome was mostly underground, under the surface of the ice, wasn't it? That's a good point. You know, actually, when it was originally built, that dome was built in the mid 70s. It was on the surface, but guess what happened? It got buried by snow. And there's actually an older station that was built 1957, International Polar Year and all that stuff, geophysical year. And that was on the surface too, but that's under about, I don't know, 20 feet or 30 feet of ice now. And you're, you're not allowed to go. And you can go to that station, but you're not supposed to. But in the winter, people do anyway, because there's nobody watching. Uh, the... But since then, the uh, geodesic dome was built in the mid 70s. That's when I think of the South Pole. That's what I think of. But it's gone now. But they would have to actually uh, have uh, snow plows going most of the summer to clear out the snow so it wouldn't get buried any deeper than it was. Seems like that might be easier to heat. Because it's buried in the yeah. snow? Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, true. Okay. And then the other place uh, in Antarctica we built instruments for is a place called Dome A. And that's the highest point on the Antarctic Plateau. I think it's like 14,500 feet. It's just about high as Mauna Kea is in Hawaii, but in Antarctica. And that's the high point on that topo map there. And so we, my team has built remote observatories that operate there. So there, in, that, in that case, you fly in there, you fly to Christchurch, you fly to McMurdo, you fly to South Pole Base, and then you take a smaller uh, plane uh, to Antarctica, uh, to the Dome A, uh, and they drop you off there for about a week. You set things up and they come rescue you and you fly home. And then the whole thing is built to, uh, to operate automatically, autonomously, I should say, with a mixture of diesel generators and solar cells. Uh, next slide. And here's a picture of the instrument. Uh, the, the, the PI of that one is Craig Kalesa. He's a former student of mine. Um, and that's it. what was underneath the mailbox cover was this instrument. The light comes in from the top left. It's a, a parabolic reflector and gets reflected down to the detector. And the aircraft that takes you to uh, Dome is a twin otter, Canadian airplanes. A lot of Canadian stuff in Antarctica. Uh, next slide. All right. But what if you need to go higher? You know, you need to get, because you want to get some of these higher frequency transitions I talked about. Uh, even Dome A isn't good, high enough and dry enough. So you either need to go to space and have a space mission, which costs lots and lots of money, or you could do it from like uh, airborne astronomy, but that still quite isn't high and dry enough. So we started uh, uh, about 15 years ago looking into balloon-borne astronomy. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and the reason, and the reason I was showing this book is this is the How and Why Wonder Book. How many people remember these? Yeah, How and Why Wonder Book. My mom got me this book from the A&P in 1961. This is the book. And I remember getting it, looking at all these fun things and spacecraft and stuff. And then there's this funny balloon in the middle. And, I, and, and it turns out that's what I do. I do the balloon thing in the middle. Uh, next slide. Right, because the terahertz payload is right there. And so what we fly from Antarctica is pretty much ex exactly, we fly at about 120,000 feet. Yeah, next slide. Right, and so we did our first balloon-borne uh, observatory down there in 2012. 
called the Stratospheric Terrorist Observatory. We flew it again in uh, 2016. Uh, next slide. Yeah, I'm going to show you pictures of that. Yep. So we flew it in 2012. Uh, we recovered it, refurbished it, and flew it again in 2016. Saves you about $100 million doing stuff like that. Uh, and I know it's crazy. Uh, and then uh, based upon uh, the success we had with that mission in 2016, and I'll show you some more pictures of it, we were awarded another mission called Gusto, which was supposed to fly in 2022, but with COVID, it was delayed a year. We're going to fly it this, this year in December. Um, and the, you can always go ahead to the next slide. Right. And it's the NASA uh, Explorer Mission of Opportunity, it's called. And it's a one meter telescope. It looked, it's, it's an optical piece of glass uh, that was made at the borosilicate glass that was made at the University of Arizona. Um, except when we fly it, uh, it has solar panels that produce about two kilowatts of power. We've, the detectors, again, are superconducting detectors. We have both refrigerators and liquid helium to cool it down. Um, and the whole, I'll show you a picture of it in reality. The whole thing weighs about two tons. And it's 25 feet high and 25 feet wide. It's, it's held, I know, it goes up on a balloon. And it's not just uh, our little group in Arizona, but all these different institutions are involved, one of which, the third one there is the Applied Physics Lab. And that's where I'm headed to tomorrow uh, to go work on this. Uh, Did next. You guys putting some of the payload on for it? Well, well what, actually, we built the telescope and the instrument at the University of Arizona. APL built the gondola which is equivalent to a spacecraft bus that has pointing, star cameras, and guidance and control. Uh, next slide. And so what it's going to do is it goes up to 120,000 feet, and we're going to look at the Milky Way, and we're going to map about 124 square degrees of the Milky Way. And how we do that is we make little meandering drift scans back and forth across the galactic plane, and read out the receiver the whole time. And every little line of sight, I'm gonna walk over the screen again. You follow the red line out from the observatory, it uh, cuts through the galaxy. Every line of sight will produce a spectrum like you see on the bottom. And the spectrum on the bottom you can see has three groups of lines, in this case, carbon lines. And also carbon monoxide is shown here. So why do you think there might be three groups of lines looking along that line of sight through the galaxy? Arms. Yeah, we're looking at different spiral arms of the galaxy. And the galaxy is rotating differentially, it rotates faster in the middle and less fast on the outer side. And those, that rotation causes a Doppler shift. If the galaxy wasn't rotating, all those lines would be right on top of each other. But since the galaxy is rotating, it spreads it out in frequency space because of the Doppler effect. So that allows us, if we know the rotation curve of the galaxy ahead of time, which we do from optical astronomy and other things, we can look at the velocity of each of those peaks and figure out where along the, side it, where along the line of sight it came from. That allows us to make three-dimensional maps of the Milky Way and these lines. Um, the other thing we're going to do is every four hours or so, we'll flip the thing around and look at the Large Magellanic Cloud. Um, the C and the galactic center are like 180 degrees apart as viewed from Antarctica in the summertime. So we can only uh, look at the LMC every few hours because we have to spend the rest of the time because we want to look at the sun charges our batteries. So we have to go on battery power to see the LMC. But over the course of uh, 75 days, which is our mission lifetime, uh, we'll be able to map all of the LMC and about 120 square degrees of the Milky Way. How's it stabilized? How's it stabilized? Well, mostly you know, gravity does it because we're hanging from the balloon. Um, but how we point is on the very top of it, there's this circle uh, right here you can see. That's a 75 pound uh, reaction wheel. So that's how we, what's that? Is it a reaction gyro that could actually provide stabilization? Well, we actually have three fiber optics gyros in our inertial measurement unit that tells us where we're pointed uh, and star cameras and all that. But the reaction wheel is, is used to allow us to slew an azimuth and hold it steady. So it spins around like, you know, either clockwise or counterclockwise to rotate you and then it stops. 
There's also a, a second wheel, like a it's literally a bicycle wheel. I'll show in a minute. That helps to if, if the if the payload wants to pendulate or swing on the balloon, the bicycle wheel takes that out. We're actually able to hold position on the sky to within about five arc seconds. Yeah. Is 75 days typical for a high altitude balloon? Like no, ours is unusual. Um, in that, uh, well, the balloons, as we all know from recent history, uh, can last a long time. Uh, but, uh, but, but for, but you know, the case of our balloons, uh, normally a NASA balloon, uh, they, they, no one's asked me, why do you fly these balloons from Antarctica? So why do I fly these balloons from Antarctica? I'm asking you. Okay, you might guess. I didn't get it. Why, why would we fly these balloons from Antarctica? Well, I think the, the guy got it right over here. One thing is we don't have to worry about overflight of other countries so much. Um, you could also do this from, uh, we, they, NASA also does it from uh, um, Sweden, uh, and they launch balloons, and they, they have to bring them down over Canada. Why? Because we can't get uh, overflight from Russia. And so it has to come down. Uh, in Antarctica, you can go around and around and around. And the other thing is down there, it's during the summer when we launch these, the sun's up all the time. So we have solar power all the time to power our payload. Huh? How do you keep balloons within without going over the ocean first? Yeah, well, what happens is, is that there's jet streams. Oh, okay. And there's a jet stream that sets up called the anti-cyclone around Antarctica that pretty much keeps the payload on track. I'll show you that in a minute. So it's not where you can find it. it tells you, predicts your travel. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, there's actually a meteorologist from NASA who's down on the ice with us, and we get daily weather briefings about it. That's right. So we have to wait until the high altitude winds set up on this circulation pattern, typically we do. And it can be early December to around Christmas before those winds will set up and you're allowed to launch. However, the Gusto mission, because it has such a long um, baseline time of 75 days or longer, uh, we're the first balloon payload who's officially allowed to go off the continent. And NASA's already got the overflight permissions from the countries down there to let us do that. Uh, next slide. OK. So what this is, I think if you move the mouse around, there's a video here. Yeah, you can hit that arrow. So. This, remember I told you we can make three-dimensional maps of the galaxy? Well, here's an example of it. We did some, with some other data we had. So we're able to break the spiral arms up and make sh show where they came from in, in the region. And also we can spin it around in three-dimensional space. And it's all because the data is velocity encoded because we're looking at spectral lines and frequency. So it's kind of cool. Uh, next slide. All right, this is just some specs about our payload. Yeah, it's big. Is heavy. It takes a lot of power, and we fly it. Uh, next slide. Here's the uh, the instrument, the Cryostat. We built this in my lab at the U of A. It has 150 liters of liquid helium in it. This one does. Remember the little blue one in, at the South Pole? Well, this is it's a big, big, big brother. Um, and it has a lot of receivers and stuff in it. Look at those different uh, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen lines. Uh, next slide. How long did it take you to build it? Three years. It's the most sophisticated, complicated, hard as hell to make work receiver ever built on planet Earth at these at these frequencies. What is the window into that chamber? Oh, uh, what is the window made of? Yeah. Uh, it's made of like a Teflon. Teflon. It's like a radome type material. Or you can also use uh, uh, crystalline quartz and then you uh, AR code it, anti-reflection code it. And then the little detectors we use look like this in the end. This was built by the Space Research Organization of the Netherlands, these little detectors we have uh, that they call high electron bolometer mixers. Uh, next slide. And this is on the, the observatory is undergoing INT now, integration and test. And so it's almost all together up at APL, where I'll be tomorrow. Uh, next slide. Right, so here's actually some cool pictures from our 2016 campaign. Uh, this is down in Antarctica. There's a hang, couple of hangers there called Hangar 1 and Hangar 2, like Thing 1 and Thing 2. 
So hangar one, that's where we observe, uh, assembled the gondola and the telescope. If you look at the bottom left, there's another former student of mine, Chris Grappi's professor at Evil ASU. Uh, he went up there. Um, that gives you, I have Chris in there for scale to show you how big the thing is. And then it hangs off the end of a crane before it's launched. And here's a picture I took with my phone of it once it had uh, left. This is December 9th, 2016. Uh, next slide. And this is what the earlier version of that instrument looked like uh, back in the day. And then nice thing about these blue missions, there's lots of grad students involved. And here's uh, Kay Davis. She was a student of Chris's from ASU. She's now a professor somewhere. Uh, next slide. And here's our launch team on launch day. Now there's the balloon is being inflated in the background. It's helium. Okay, because I'm like, how do you look technically work? Yeah, I wouldn't want to be nearby. Well, <laughs> well with, with something that big, but smaller. You can yeah. Obviously. Yeah, and so it's helium. And it's, this one is a, a 35 million cubic feet of helium going That's to that balloon. 35 million. Where's your budget? Our budget for this project was about $10 million. Okay, and then the, uh, the balloon actually continues all the way out to over here. Um, and the, you can actually, here's the crane. And here's that payload that was in the hangar hanging there. And the, uh, can you go back one slide? I'm sorry. Another slide. No, oh yeah, here's it, it's good. So here's the balloon. And then here's the parachute it comes down on. And then there's the actual payload. And the parachute, like when we were kids, we'd take like a hand, handkerchief and some thread and, and a rock and we'd just come down. That's kind of what the deal is here. So the parachute's already deployed. And there's actually explosive bolts up here that when the time comes, you can separate the parachute and the payload from the balloon so it can come down. Okay, next slide, next slide, next slide. All right, here's a launch video. So I should, hopefully it'll run. Yeah, there you go. So they let loose of it. The balloon is choked off temporarily right here. It, that collar comes off and the helium can expand all the way down to the top of the parachute. When it gets to altitude, circle from where the top of it is now to the to the top of that parachute, and then it blows over because you make you let the you, let, you launch the balloon from downwind, and when it gets a little bit off of here, you see the shadow go by. There's like a little pinchers up here. They'll let it go and it'll drift away. And it'll go. You have, to be, you have to be very patient in ballooning. Uh, the first time we launched in 2012, it took eight launch attempts before we, we got out there and the weather would go, whether the winds were calm enough for us to launch. Where do you aim to retrieve it? What's that? Where do you aim to retrieve it? Well, it come, I'll show you in just a minute where, where it comes around. Yeah, next slide. All right, and then we can have a little mission control, you know. So that's Mike Collins from APL there. There's Dave Young, Bill Peters from U of A. So Mike's looking at the uh, the gondola systems, the power, the guidance, the star cameras, and Abe and Bill are monitoring that crazy receiver system we have. Uh, this is actually from uh, the Crary Lab at McMurdo Base. So we can run it from the McMurdo Base uh, as long as the payload's within line of sight, just using X-band and S-band stuff. And then once it's over the horizon, then we switch to Tedris and Iridium and now evil Starlink uh, to command and control. Uh, next slide. And here's the first light spectra we got. Now these are a bunch of, unlike CO and stuff I showed you earlier, this is that carbon, ionized carbon spectrum, which is the most important spectral line for understanding the life cycle of the ISM. And this is, uh, was taken toward Eta Carina which is a massive binary star formation region in the south where it's got two massive stars. I used to think you could only have 100 solar mass stars, but one of them is about 150 solar masses. And you say, why isn't, why isn't a thing called supernova? And it is about to go supernova. And it's burping and farting and all this stuff. And this really makes the whole region around it tortured. So that's an optical image of it on the top left. And here's the, another image of it on the bottom. And then this is the carbon lines that we observed toward it. This was the first light spectrum. Uh, next slide. 
And in the end, toward that one region, it was about square degrees, we got 1,100 lines of sight, 1,100 spectra. We got it in about an hour. And uh, when when you apply for these NASA missions, it's sort of like a you know you, you put a proposal in, and there's probably 25 or 30 other proposals, and they'll down select to two, and they give you uh, about a year and a million dollars to do a detailed design study, and then you have a site visit and all this stuff. And then if you make it through that, then you go give a briefing to the associate administrator at NASA headquarters for 15 minutes. Then he'll select between your project and the other guys. And so when I was at headquarters a few years ago, I showed this slide. And uh, you look at, well, you know, you have all these little tiny lines, you know, it's like, well, it's not very impressive. But later on, uh, we were selected. And, the, and I was told by one of the reviewers that this slide is what got us selected because in one hour, we got more data than the Herschel Space Observatory did uh, of this particular line, and it cost a billion dollars. And so he said, okay, we'll, we'll let you go. You, you go, go build that thing. Uh, next slide. All right, and here's a picture of Adacrine again. We'll go on to the next slide. Oh, so this is the movie, I'm sorry, back up. And then I think you'll be able to find us, if you go back a slide, there's a, if you, I think you'll, yeah, there you go. Thank you, and you're reading my mind now. So what we're doing here, this is uh, this colors are stepping through the spectral lines in velocity space. So initially, you see the high velocity stuff. So the U, the Eta Carina, that massive uh, uh, binary system. Oh yeah, one star is 150 solar masses. This little brother is like 60 solar masses. So it puts out a lot of UV light, and the UV light runs up against the dust and molecular cloud. And what that does is excite the emission of that ionized carbon line, which you are you are seeing here, and uh, the uh, the blue. Anyway, okay. Uh, next slide. Yeah, and that's kind of the stationary picture of it. So the blue line here is this ionized carbon, which acts like a shock is where the shock front is, and then behind that is the carbon monoxide emission, and all the stars will ultimately form stars and planets. Are behind here, and the carbon two kind of like is almost like a heat shield from the UV light for the rest of the cloud. Uh, next slide. There's the paper, long and boring. <laughs> uh, next slide, and some pictures about how we figured out what that region looks like based upon our observations. Uh, next slide, and then the whole thing to answer your question will ultimately come down on a parachute. This isn't our payload coming down the parachute, but it's another balloon payload that gives you the idea. Um, next slide. And then what happens is the bottom left here, we launched from the Ross Ice Shelf in McMurdo, goes up to 120,000 feet, gets caught in those jet streams, and kind of makes its way around. Uh, there's the South Pole base right there, we've got to know, know about now. It goes around, and at this point, the, the NASA will say, so call them, say, hey, Chris, how's your payload? I'll say, oh, it's great, let's go again. I'll say, okay. And then you fly around. It takes about 14 days to go around once, um, depending on the speed. It's typically about 14 knots is how fast it's going around in that jet stream. So you go around twice, and at the end of the, the second time around, 21, 22 days, we were about out of liquid helium. So he said, bring it on down. And it turned out that there was a team coming back from the South Pole hauling trash and stuff back to the South Pole. <laughs> and so they stopped and picked up our payload, which wasn't trash, and brought it back. And so here it is after it was recovered in the hangar. The only thing that was messed up was the solar panels. Everything else was pristine. Oh, man, we're easy compared to everything else. Yeah, so it's we're kind of like these, go, like these gondolas are built like a NASCAR crash cage to protect the payload in it. So everything was still working. The crash site even still had a vacuum. Um, yeah, so you could fly it again. Uh, Did they do damage to it because it looked like they presumed it was trash? Or no, no, we knew they knew they knew it was trash, and we they brought it down within a hundred meters of where the uh, traverse team was coming, and they were able to pick it up and put it on a sled and bring it back. We were just fortunate. Uh, next slide. We got caught by a semi a tractor trailer. Yeah. Uh, our payload got hung up while it was falling. It got oh, you did ballooning? Yeah. Oh, cool. It got hung up on a trailer and it went to. Yeah, that's bizarre. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> was that in Texas? 
No, this is in uh, Maryland. Actually. In Maryland? Oh, wow. Well, and there's a, a couple of fun slides. It isn't all work, but mostly. Uh, so here's some slides. These are all like, uh, okay, here is a Sunday night lecture in McMurdo. This is their big cafeteria. On, this is on the coast. And there's not a hell of a lot to do in McMurdo. So people actually come to the Sunday night science lectures. Uh, there's not, yeah. So I've done a couple of these. Um, uh, I think I took this slide. Next slide. And they, they celebrate the holidays big time down there to, to mark the passes of time. So when I, when I first get there, it's about in time for the McMurdo Halloween party, which is quite a thing, as you might imagine. Um, and then over time, the decorations change, and it's Thanksgiving. And then they have a big Thanksgiving meal. And this is my team from the launch back in uh, 2016. Very like handsome. I, I took the picture, so there's a very handsome team. So, <laughs> What's that? Is that a popcorn machine? Oh, there is a it's an ice cream machine. Oh, okay. It looks like a popcorn machine. No, no, it's an ice cream. They call it uh, in the Australia they call it Frosty Boy. So the, the thing is you get you get Frosty Boys every night that have ice cream machine. Uh, yeah. Uh, next slide. And then they also have a, a, a run, 5K turkey trot, it's called, around McMurdo. And here's some of our team that uh, ran. I did not. Is that a fundraiser for something? No, just for the hell of it. <laughs> uh, next slide. And then there's uh, McMurdo has three bars. And so this is our post-launch party in one of those bars with some of our uh, team members. There's three bars and a coffee uh, shop. Uh, next slide. And then also, as the decorations change from Thanksgiving to Christmas and Christmas to New Year's, then they have uh, what they call ice stock, uh, like Woodstock. But with the, because there's a lot of musical people in the base. Because again, um, in Antarctica, what happens is for all for every scientist, there are like nine people who actually keep the base going. We were talking about that at dinner tonight. And all those people who work down there doing logistics have to pass psychological testing to be happy people. <laughs> but luckily, the scientists do not have to do that because I would, I would not pass. <laughs> well, there's not a murder rate, but sadly, there is a death rate uh, down there. Um, not, it's not every year, but this can be things that happen. It's, it's a little dangerous. Um, but, here's, but they have a lot of bands you know, from the station. Different groups will play, and that's I stock. Uh, next slide. And there are penguins on the coast. And this is Mike Collins. You might remember him. He was one of the operators. You're looking at the APL gondola. And the penguins really like Mike. So, and I think that, OK, next slide. And then but at some point, the fun has to end. You get back on the C-130. But you're pretty happy to get on that C-130, I must tell you, after a few months. And you fly home. And that's it, I think. Thank you very much. I assume there's a, uh, an ice runway in New yeah, Zealand. Yeah. No, there's wheels. They can retract the skis, and there's wheels underneath. Yeah. I think that's the last slide. So I've kept you guys long enough. I think we'll go to one more question. Yeah. Quick question. Oh, please. Uh, how many of the balloons? Observations did you need? Just the one, or has there been several that you kept? I've, uh, in, in ARC, I've led the, the two campaigns we've had. But there are many, balloon, there are balloon flights every year from Antarctica. Right. Uh, but from these two, I'm the PI of those, and I'm also the principal investigator of the Gusto mission, which is going to fly later this year. Don't you see I have all the white, gray hair? You know, yeah, no, no. stressful. <laughs> okay, with both those uh, missions, they were through the University of Arizona? Uh, yeah, I'm the PI on both from the University of Arizona. But again, the uh, on the, the applied physics lab at Johns Hopkins is a, a big partner in it. So I get half the money to build the instrument. They get the other half for doing the gondola, basically. Uh, well, thank you. Online. We have a few questions, okay, good. I think, online. Well, and you can see them kind of there. But uh, Peter, if you want to, uh, you got your hand raised, I think. Why don't you ask a question? I don't know if you can hear Peter or not. 
Can you guys, uh, let's see, who else do we have? Let's go down the line here. Um, Paul? Yes. Paul. Is uh, Akeem, are you on? Everyone needs to unmute if they're going to talk. How about Alan? Anybody that's got a hand raised and is muted, go go for it. They're all still muted. Do you, do you have to unmute them or? No, they should be able to. Uh, well, um, right, not muted. People have to unmute themselves. Oh, Paul. Yeah. Well, Paul's um, unmuted. <laughs> All right. Well, if you have a question, you have about 30 seconds to type it. <laughs> I see speech in the right hand window and I don't hear it. Oh, that, that's us. Yeah. Uh, I actually have a question. Yeah. I noticed in some of those last slides, particularly the the uh, Sunday night or the science talk in the bar, it was dark. Is that because there are no windows? No, there are windows. Um, and it's actually uh, in the summertime, it's light all the time. Yeah. Um, and so they put down the blinds. Oh, okay. Yeah. And that's very important, right? So like in the dorm rooms, to keep the light out, we actually usually tape up aluminum foil over the windows so you can sleep. Yeah. My dad yeah. worked nights. That's what he did. Did aluminum yeah. foil? Yeah, it was yeah. great yeah. stuff. Are y'all going to broadcast the Houston launch live? I think so. Uh, since it's an official NASA Explorer mission, they have their PR department involved. So they'll do a better job than me, for sure. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Openings. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> How do you detect terror? Oh, so basically we'd have these really high-frequency radio receivers, just like you have your, your FM radio in your car. We, it's a radio receiver. That's right. In fact, how many of you guys built crystal radios when you were kids? Crystal radios? Yeah, yeah. Well, basically, at these frequencies, uh, but back in the old days, and the you know when I, well when the radios first started, there were no amplifiers, no transistors, or even tubes yet, uh, amplifiers. So just basically have a crystal detector, and you'd listen to what came over the crystal detector. Well, at these very high frequencies, there are no amplifiers yet. So the first thing the signal runs into is a crystal, but it's a superconducting you know crystal that down converts the signal to a lower frequency. The, so the, the receivers look complicated, but the very first thing is basically like old fashioned crystal radio because there's no amplifiers. The amplifiers come later. It's a mixer. It's absolutely not linear because it's a superconducting uh, transition. And then, and then to put a fine point on it, we also have to have a local oscillator to mix a very high frequency transmitter. But it's a very straightforward thing, in fact, and that in the end, we have to sort of de detect the signal on what would, in the old days, would be like a crystal, but we have to use a superconducting detector to get the massive nonlinearity we need. Is it a polarizing receiver or an all polarization? Good question. Actually, on these, we, uh, if there's a picture of that, that remember that, that the kid with the glasses holding it up? Um, actually, what we use are spiral antennas to, to channel the radiation to the actual superconducting detector. So in that sense, it's, it's sensitive both vertical and horizontal. Uh, in the SuperCam instrument I showed at the very beginning, that's a feed horn. It had rectangular waveguide. It was linearly polarized. But the one uh, is, that we have here is sort of dual polarization. So what was it that you found about the Eta Carina cloud? Oh, what are we able to find? Well, we're actually able to sort out uh, what the uh, effect of all that UV radiation was on the cloud and where the real uh, shock fronts were and the ionization regions and where it goes from being ionized medium to a molecular medium. Remember that life cycle chart I showed at the beginning? You go from ionized gas to molecular gas to star formation. So we're able to start to trace out that left-hand side that other people haven't done before as well. So hopefully that, so we weren't able to do a whole lot on SGO2, 
but now that with that with the more complicated receiver, more pixels we have on Gusto, we'll be able to make big old maps of the galaxy and the uh, large Magellanic, large Magellanic cloud. Well, thank you guys. Um, <laughs> You also get one of the coffee. Cups. I've been mugged. You get mugged. <laughs> okay. Maybe we'll <laughs> see it in an hour. Last time I was mugged was in Pasadena. <laughs> okay. I mean, really mugged. Thank you so much for coming. My tonight. pleasure. Uh, thanks, Novak, for showing up tonight. And uh, we'll see you Saturday at Astronomy Day, right? Or Tuesday. Tuesday. You know what? Or Tuesday. What's Tuesday? Yeah, it's yeah, Oh, yeah, you got the Eclipse group. Um, be sure to check weather, though, for Saturday. Um, check, check our website on Thursday. And uh, thanks. We'll see you next month. Thanks, man. Oh, man, sure. My pleasure. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> it's, it's, it's all fun. That's the point. So, so Chris, as your presentation.